Hi, welcome. This is The Wellbeing Show with me, uh, Noel McDermott, and my special guest tonight is Dennis Rolojo Howell. Hi, Dennis, welcome. Um, welcome. Dennis is a psychologist um, who's going to tell you all about himself in a second, but um, while I've got you, just to sort of welcome you on, um, you're probably watching this through Facebook as that's the platform that we're streaming on. Um, and so it'd be lovely to hear from you <clears throat> if you have any thoughts or suggestions or questions uh, throughout the evening. Uh, please do join us and um, it would be great to hear from you and um, to have uh, your thoughts and questions. Um, <clears throat> the other way you can join in is once I've got this frog out of my throat is that you can call us. That'd be, um, it's live at the moment, uh, unless you're watching it as a podcast later in the week. So if you're watching this on Wednesday evening and on Wednesday the 13th of May, at around about nine o'clock UK time, between nine and 10.30, um, then it's possible for you to join in the show live. That's why we keep it live during these days. Um, and you can do that by giving me a call on my mobile number. I've got the mobile here. And the number's 07506 319 745. That's 07506 319 745. It'd be great uh, to have your thoughts and comments. And um, you can give us a call if you've got some questions for, for Dennis or myself. We've got James hovering in the background. You won't be able to see him on the feed, uh, but he's there anytime we want to bring him into show. James is our technician who's here with us this evening. Um, so that number if you're calling from outside the UK is plus four four seven five oh six three one nine seven four five. It'd be great to hear from you. Um, and we're going to be talking to Dennis uh, today about his work as a psychologist um, and also uh, looking at the importance of the evidence base for uh, psychological interventions. He's a research psychologist as well. Uh, he's also got a new book out, which he's going to tell us all about. Um, and he's got a website in which collates uh, very interesting sort of psychological information for people that's available uh, for the public. And he also has a research uh, website again he's going to tell us all about these things um so without further ado i just want to say try to figure out which bit of oh, if i look like that then i'm sort of looking at you it's difficult on this online zoom stuff to know where people are positioned hello dennis it's um, yeah uh, thanks awesome. for having me here noel um yeah i'll start off with my name because it's a bit tricky to say so my name is dennis reloho howell um yeah um as you've mentioned i created this platform called PsychReg and yeah I collate um, a bunch of resources on psychology, mental health and well-being and um, it has a scholarly article on, um, it, it has an open access journal called PsychReg Journal of Psychology and then I also do a bit of what um, the, the same as what you're doing. Um, I also on YouTube where I talk to interesting people within psychology, mental health and well-being. So that's pretty much what I've been doing for the last six years. And Great. Well, it's fantastic to have you uh, with us here. Um, how is it going? Let's just catch up with you personally. How's it going? Sorry if I seem distracted. I'm trying to get my iPad working as well and um, so that I can sort of uh, see the comments as they're coming in through Facebook Live and uh, hopefully respond to people. So um, please excuse me. Um, if um, if I seem a bit distracted, I'm still a bit of a sort of Luddite when it comes to all this technology. I'm not quite <laughs> sure it works, but I think uh, you're more au fait with it than I am. So um, you might be better at, at getting me. Mm. So, I'm um, still learning. Yeah. So how, how am I today? Um, yeah. Well, pretty much the same day as usual um, for the past two months, just like everyone else. So um, just staying at home with my husband and um I'm pretty much spending most of my time on my website, on Netflix, and then um, occasionally I would read a book, but it's pretty much repetitive now. So I think just like most everyone else, um, I can't wait for the lockdown to be over so we could have a bit of normalcy with our life. But um, I would say my, my life is not really, my, my life is not really different from the lockdown because I'm, I'm a freelancer. So most of the time I really work from home, but what makes it, really different now is that you know there's there's a bit of restriction to the places that i can visit and i, I really miss that yeah yeah but all in all um psychologically and in terms of my well-being i'm pretty much 
um, all being um, in, in terms of the current situation. Okay. And how are you managing to do that? I mean, as a psychologist, what sort of uh, skills are you using that are helping you? Because a lot of people are feeling quite anxious about the um, current situation, finding it quite difficult. But, but how do you think you're managing to sort of remain balanced and sort of okay within this situation? Yeah, uh, I think it's got more to do with my personality more than my background in psychology. But of course, um, there, there would still be an element of my background in psychology, but it's more to do with my personality because I always look for something positive. Okay. And um, I'm, I'm actually quite a funny person in, in, in real life. Um, I, I always try to look for something funny. Um, and I'm also a bit resilient. Um, I think it's got to do with my, my background, my childhood. So, right. uh, yeah, I, I'm fairly quite doing well. Um, the positivity and resilience are two. Yeah, positivity, my... resilience and humour, I think. I think um, those are two. Those are some really important traits. Um, and you say you think it comes from your sort of childhood. So mm -hmm. Maybe we can follow through on that. What do you think were, how do you think you developed this resilience, this positivity, this humour? Were you born with it or was it something that your family? I, I, th I think the best way to do that is to give you a bit of a um, texture of my trajectory in life. Um, I grew up from, Great. I, I, was, I was born in the Philippines, so I just came here in the country about um, seven years ago. So <laughs> I spent my childhood in, in the slum in the Philippines, um, just to give you um, an idea of what the kind of place I grew up with. So we did not have a toilet, we didn't have a running water, we didn't have electricity um, when I was 10. Um, so it was a completely different life. Um, so I think that kind of shaped my, um, how I perceive my life. Um, you know, like if you can't really live with those basic necessities, I think, um, there are far, far worse things in life. And uh, well, when I always, when I always um, encounter something like challenging in life, I just always remind myself of my childhood, of how I grew up, and how my parents managed to raise three children. So, I, I think at an early age, my parents instilled to me the value of resilience and the value of um, positivity, and always try to improve your situation. So you, you grew up in a slum, you say? Yeah, I grew up in a slum in, in the Philippines. Okay. Yeah. Um, not, not your typical place where you'd expect somebody to have resilience and sense of humour and positivity. I think um, the, the sense of humour is a bit ingrained in the Filipino culture. Um, I, yeah. I don't know if you're familiar about the Philippines, but it's quite a disaster prone country. We always have typhoon, we always have earthquake, but um, the, the Filipino people is known for um, always seeing, um, I wouldn't say the funny side, but rather the bright side of, right. of, of the situation. And I think that that kind of, you know, that kind of ability allows people, uh, allows the Filipino t people to um, to flourish, to thrive in spite of the situation. And I think um, I, I have acquired that, um, that, that skill, that ability. And then in terms of resilience, it's something that I had because of my parents. Um, right. Um, especially my mom. Um, I've seen her grit. I've seen her determination. Yeah. yeah. And they sort of instilled those sort of qualities into you. Yeah, they, they've instilled that to me because my, my parents did not have a formal education. So um, they instilled on the three children that you always have to persevere. You always have to value education because yeah. if you want to live, if you, if you want to come, come out of this um, slum, that's what they told us at a young age. Well, you have to study hard. And, and so and you I, I, my, my parents, I'm very proud of what my parents have done to us. Right. All her three children have a um, master's degree, one is doing a PhD. So um, in spite of, you know, the scarcity of resources, um, they, they managed to um, raise us very well. It's an extraordinary story, Dennis. Thank you.
So it's really impressive. I mean, really impressive in terms of your parents and the sort of commitment um, that they had to sort of raising you up, which is not unusual. Um, my parents come from very humble background as well. And um, they sort of wanted us to have a better life than they had. had. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, you know, that's quite common. Um, but the, the, let's talk about resilience and what that looks like and what your understanding of it, because I think mm -hmm. it's, um, it's quite an important theme at the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, around the world about um, uh, sort of what resilience means. So mm -hmm. can, can you talk us through what you understand, um, both personally maybe and also professionally? Yeah, Re resilience, yeah resilience is, in, in a nutshell, is our ability to bounce back. So yeah, life is not really, you know, as cliche as, as it may sound, it's not really a walk in the park, you know, it's not really meant to, you know, everything's not going to be enjoyable and we always have you know we would in, always encounter life events that would challenge our emotion that would challenge our ability to cope and when we're able to bounce back when we're able to still thrive and flourish um, even though um, we, we encountered some setbacks that that is resilience mm -hmm. um, it's not because we're physically strong or we, it's not because we're emotionally strong but we have that inner desire to you know, to, to recover from what we've, we've experienced. And yeah, that's my whole understanding of what resilience is. And is it and something that we're either born with or can we learn it? Is it a, a, a I wouldn't say that we're born with it. Um, actually, um, your, your question reminds me of um, a recent interview that I've done on, on my podcast. Um, I was talking to a mental health expert from... Um, University of Edinburgh, and I, I understand you also had him, um, Dr. Mark Halterhoff from Edinburgh. Oh, Mark, yes, he was amazing. Yeah. 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 And um, I also interviewed him on my podcast, and he, he said that, um, I, I love the kind of analogy that he said, not, not everyone is actually born with, you know, good physique, but it's something that we could improve on. And I, 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 I follow the same analogy when it comes to resilience, you know, it's something that we could, we, we could work on. And I, I think it's something to do with, you know, um, being exposed to um, a lot of challenging setbacks and discovering that you can actually recover from it. Uh, I think that's one thing that we could improve our levels of resilience. Okay. And how would you say you're resilient? How do you know that you're resilient as a sort of a measure? How do you say it in yourself? Um, I, I would say that I'm resilient because um, it doesn't really, I'm, I don't easily get, um, shall we say, affected by um, situations. Right. Um, it, it takes a lot before um, I would be affected. Um, I easily cope with job loss, with um, death in the family. Um, right. Yeah. So you take those things in your stride and you, you keep going. Yeah. Okay. Okay, and so I, I guess it's sort of quite a useful skill at the moment to be sort of help people think about well, the sort of things that might build resilience um, in an individual. If we think about going to that resilience gym, as it were, mm -hmm. think of Mark's idea of you go to the gym to build your physique. Mm -hmm. If we went to the resilience gym, what sort of equipment is there and what sort of things do we need to, to do, do you think? Yeah, that's an interesting question. And I like the idea of um, resilience gym. I think what we would have to have in a resilience toolkit is, you know, like um, hearing live experience of people who've actually encountered traumatic events right. and how they actually cope with it. And I think I think that's the best way to, you know, harness our ability to be resilient, learning from other people's experience. And also, um, if, if someone like a mental health professional yourself is trying to help us realize that actually it's not it's not really that bad you can actually recover from this and with, with the help of mental health professional i i think we can able to you know bolster a level of resilience and i i think what we can learn from this uh, from this talk about you know resilience is that it's something that we could really cultivate yeah. and if there's one thing that we could actually um benefit from this lockdown for lack of better word um is that you know it's, it's time for us to discover certain aspects of ourselves whether it's resilience whether it's actually um learning a new habit or le learning a new hobby or you know just just yeah. finding out some some strengths within you um so that's about sort of reframing the experience I guess. yeah reframing the experience and just just trying to make good use of your time during the lockdown 
have you made good use of your time? I don't want to put you on the spot, but have there been any goals that you've had yourself that you, you would be interested yes, in? Yes, I'm, I'm actually, um, I've finished reading a book that I've been putting off on hold for quite some time, and um, that's something. And um, I've done a few things on my website that I've always wanted to do. And just, um, I, I'm trying to watch a few um, Spanish language lessons on YouTube, because that's yeah. always something that also, um, I uh, always also want to improve my my Spanish skills. OK, we've got a, a, a couple of questions that are coming up in the commentary, which I might bring up. I just want to make a note uh, for people who are watching. There's a bit of a time lag between mm -hmm. writing things and us being able to see it and then us answering. It's all a bit sort of um, trippy time traveling stuff that's happening at the moment mm -hmm. uh, so I'll get your questions and then I'll sort of put them to uh, people but one of the things I would like to ask is that for people who are watching and listening in um, is thinking about this topic of resilience and what Dennis has just said about um, you know setting yourself goals within this lockdown and that being something that can foster resilience, and which is you know, something that we all know sort of psychologically is correct, that seeing sort of something positive that you can aim for. So I'd be really interested in knowing what sort of goals um, that the people who are watching um, this evening's broadcast uh, set themselves, if any, um, during lockdown. Uh, of course, a goal might be just to give yourself a break and not <laughs> have any goals. That's perfectly reasonable as well. But I'd be really interested throughout the show if people were sort of um, phone in or just in the comments section on Facebook, uh, let us know. Um, uh, we have um, a, a variety of people watching us. Um, and uh, one of them is Goldie Blake, um, who's uh, just brought up an issue that I think um, that you might like to talk to uh, talk about, um, which is around um, inherited trauma, um, because you were you you were just talking, weren't you, Dennis, about um, the sort of having grown up in the Philippines and this idea that um, the quite a potentially traumatic events were happening in your childhood and, and that your your parents and your culture were used to these types of sort of natural disasters that may have or may not have produced trauma in people. So we might begin to talk about inherited trauma later. So just to say, Goldie, thanks for the question. And we're going to come back to that. I want to continue, though, for a little while on this um, teasing out of Dennis, some of these ideas about resilience and the resilience toolkit. Um, and sort of uh, really uh, maybe going into that a little bit more. So um, thinking about resilience, um, one of the things I think about is I think about in maybe in three areas, there's sort of cognitive skills and uh, physiological, emotional uh, skills, and then there's social skills. Uh, mm -hmm. because those three elements um, that might be sort of looked at in terms of the types of areas that we want to work on. Um, as a psychologist, I guess you understand this notion of uh, cognitive restructuring. Mm -hmm. um, it's a very common thing in cognitive behavioural therapy. Uh, and you've begun to talk about it just in terms of your life experience. So you've just talked about reframing experiences so that you don't have to see them. What are the types of um, cognitive um, um, uh, uh, sort of tricks do you think that are that are quite useful I'm thinking about some of the things around balanced thinking for example uh, issues around that and how people might challenge their thinking so maybe we can talk a little bit about the power of our thoughts mm. and the sort of impact that they have upon us so uh, one of the things I'm thinking is that um, having depressive anxious or traumatizing thoughts and the impact upon them on ourselves uh, and what those and maybe we can talk about that a little bit because it seems to me you don't go into those types of that way of thinking you mm -hmm. stay with the thinking which allows you to be flexible um, in your cognitive styles um, mm -hmm. so what would you say about that in terms of sort of the types of skills and thought uh, and ideas that people might get into yeah i i think i link that with um what you mentioned earlier about inherited trauma um if if you try to look back at what happened to your life and try to reframe it let's say um you you, you know that there's a, there's a common expression like it could have been worse and i think that that's a that's a common um strategy that we could um 
that we could use that is it, it could have it could have been worse um so it it could have been you know I, I could have been dead um something worse could have happened but yeah. instead I'm still alive and I'm I still have the chance to improve my life and I think that's that's one way that we can actually reframe our mind and try to look back at um what what you said inherited trauma yeah um j j uh, I think I'll set myself as an example um you know, like when, when, when I talk to people that I grew up in the slum and then um, we don't have running water, we don't have electricity. Looking back as a child, I don't, re I don't really see it as a problem. My parents, my, of course, my parents would see it as a problem. But as a child, you just see it as a fact of life. Um, yeah, you don't have electricity, you don't have running water. But yeah, you, you're, you're enjoying, you know, playing with your kids, you're enjoying playing with your neighbors. So um I, I think that's one way to, you know, restructure, to reframe your thinking of um, a, a potentially traumatic experience. Okay. So looking at how um, you can then go back on some of your mm -hmm. previous experiences mm -hmm. and with your current sort of understanding of things mm -hmm. uh, begin to sort of question um, mm -hmm. the, the old narrative. Um, mm -hmm. and, and challenge some of that. Um, so that's a really good idea for people. Thinking about other uh, sort of issues around resilience, thinking about the sort of social support and um, the community support that might exist for people, because obviously that's, that's been quite challenged for people at the moment um, in terms of, um, but what sort of skills and abilities might people bring in in that range, do you think? Mm -hmm. what, 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 what people can actually, um, I, I think I, I I would like to emphasize again the importance of, you know, I'm um, listening from other people's stories because there's a power in storytelling, you know, like when you when you listen to people's stories of recovery, of resilience, of, of flourishing from from a traumatic experience, then you learn from them. And also instead of, you know, um, there's a there's a psychological concept um, called rumination when you're dwelling too much, yeah. what could have what could have gone wrong or um, what if I don't manage to survive this situation and that's actually um, increasing your anxiety and depression levels and that's not really a good way of you know coping with what you're struggling with and um, I, I think that the role of mental health professionals the psychotherapists and counselors has never been important um, in situations like this because you are there to highlight to help people highlight that actually um, that there are you you could actually turn this around as an opportunity right. um you, you could you know it's an opportunity for you to prove your skills it's an opportunity for you to improve your your skills improve your life yeah so that's maybe bringing in some of these ideas from positive psychology that if you work with difficult situations and begin to see um, sort of opportunities and gratitude and uh, mm -hmm. ways to grow um, that somehow you ameliorate or reduce uh, the pen potential traumatic impact upon people. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Yeah. Okay. And it seems that, I mean, I'm thinking about sort of the culture that you come from, coming from a culture which uh, maybe, you know, had um, many really positive coping skills and strategies. It seems that there's something going on about how uh, people talk about uh, mm -hmm. the experience mm -hmm. of these potentially traumatic uh, mm -hmm. events in these natural disasters and, and how they're processed, not just on an individual level, but on, on, almost on a community level, it seems. Yeah, and um, I, I would say so. And I, I would also, um, I also think that there's an element of religiosity involved because Philippines is a okay. really religious country. It's like 90% a Catholic country. So there's an element of, you know, it's an act of God. When, when something happens like a volcanic eruption, an earthquake, um, flooding, um, it's always an act of God. And I don't think that really translates into this country. You know, um, we won't call coronavirus or pandemic an act of God, but we always try to attribute it to something, you know, some, something natural. And, um, yeah, like in, in cultures like on the Philippines, um, religion really plays an important role. Um, okay. I, I'm an atheist, by the way, but because of religion, you try to, you know, you, you, you try to let um, someone more powerful and more, more capable than you 
um, to you know to 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 lead your life, and I think that's one thing that why why um, F Filipinos um, tend to um, survive the struggles that they face, the disasters that they encounter, and it also like somehow it sounds like that having this sort of belief in this larger mm -hmm. um, thing uh, mm -hmm. means that you can depersonalize it in a sense. Yeah, and also the belief in afterlife, you know, like. Okay. Um, uh, also, I'm not familiar with the Indian culture, and I, I think that's why also some Indians um, entertain the, the idea of reincarnation. Because you know, yeah. you might not, you might be struggling in in this current situation, but you know, in afterlife, when you become reincarnated, then who knows what will happen? So this, this, this. I mean, I think there's evidence for this as well that this mm -hmm. sense in which um, that people who hold uh, a belief in something bigger than themselves, mm -hmm. but if we make it broader than religion it might be sort of spiritual conceptions or it might be um, an attachment to a belief in the healing power of nature or the mm -hmm. universe or something like that. it doesn't necessarily have to be a religious um, but there's you know there is quite a lot of evidence that um, people who have a sense that something is bigger than themselves mm -hmm. um, tend to manage things like anxiety depression trauma more effectively and yeah. they they are they have a reduced it has a reduced impact upon them yeah uh, and also um that's also got something to do with um you, you just mentioned about evidence and this reminds me of a research about you know the, the link between religiosity and suicide and it, and um, a number of research has shown that those people who have religious belief, um, they tend not to commit suicide. And that's why in Southeast Asian countries where they're heavily religious, compared that to um, European countries where a number of people are, don't hold religious belief, um, they're more likely to commit suicide. Um, yeah, and that, that, that's, um, that's one way of showing that, you know, um, an element of religiosity, an element of um, belief to a higher divine being can actually be a good coping mechanism. So that's one, religiosity. And yeah. another is humor, because it, it, humor is a way for you to, you know, um, just try, try to, um, I wouldn't say invalidate um, the, 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 the seriousness of the issue, but you try to diminish the issue in, yeah. in a much healthier way. Well, I think humor doesn't it? It acts to enable us again to sort of depersonalize, but also to get a bigger picture on something. Mm -hmm, exactly. I mean, literally, humor is great. Now, if we laugh, we de-stress. So yeah. that's always a good idea. And I remember, you know, when I was um, still new in the profession, and I was working on uh, mm. boards, um, sort of that were quite uh, challenging places to be. Mm. Like a gallows humor, and we would. You know the professionals sort of have humorous conversations at the end of the day and it was a great way to de-stress but it also gave us a bigger picture uh, mm -hmm. you know, because we can become very intensely attached to things mm -hmm. uh, i want to sort of begin to pursue this idea of sort of evidence-based things but maybe make a point um which we're alluding to but not making um specifically but i want to make um is that we can tend to think there's an opposition between uh, modern psychological thinking and ancient thinking uh, and actually there isn't any sort of opposition but um, there is an issue about evidence uh, and maybe we can talk about evidence-based practice a little bit because I know that it's a very sort of important issue to you um, but certainly in sort of uh, modern psychological thinking does encompass um, um, sort of uh, ways of thinking, ways of being. It does have an understanding about um, um, different uh, approaches and different think, uh, ways of thinking about human experience. It's not, as people might um, think, it's not just a very narrow band. It's quite a broad thing mm -hmm. um, of human interest. And, uh, and often, I think, psychology follows the interests of the individual psychologist like mm -hmm. yourself. And it is enriched, the field is enriched by people bringing in their own personal and cultural experience. Um, mm -hmm. But it's not heavily dominated by one uh, cultural perspective. Um, so, but you've begun to talk about evidence. And I know this is a conversation that you and I had um, in our catch up um, before the show. And, and you're very sort of keen, I think, on um, that when we do sort of psychological interventions and psychotherapy, that we do it from an evidence-based perspective. What does that mean to you, an evidence-based perspective? An, an evidence-based perspective is one that involves um, 
quantitative analysis of the construct in psychology. So like, let's say, for instance, you want to touch, uh, you want to examine whether a specific intervention actually works in, let's say, alleviating symptoms of depression and anxiety, then you really have to examine it um, using, you know, using softwares and using um, um, valid methodology and you have to run an experiment. And now contrast that with, let's say, uh, a qualitative analysis where ju you're just relying on um, the lived experience of the individual and um, taking everything from that point of view. And um, I I'm more leaning towards the side of, you know, trying to quantify the behavior. Um, but I'm not saying that um, that's the only way and that's the right way to approach yeah. human behavior. Because as again, as cliche as it may sound, because we're, we're studying human behavior and, um, studying human behavior is not something that you could really contain in, in a box. Um, it's not like atoms, it's not like molecules, you're not studying DNA. So, yeah. and, and um, that, that th so many different elements when you're talking about human behavior, when you're talking about um, live experience, um, um, you've mentioned earlier about um, um, the impact of culture and the impact of, um, of course, your, your childhood experience and that's something that you can't really easily quantify but the, the reason why I'm, I'm in favor of um, a more quantitative take on studying human behavior is that um, it, it allows us to be more objective um, it's difficult to be objective in social science because it's not really like physical science and we always have disagreements um, Yep, even in politics, we have disagreements. So more so in studying um, 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 human behavior, we would have disagreements on what's the best way to approach it. But I think ultimately, um, uh, what, what, um, a main goal is that, you know, to improve a live experience, to improve how we deal with other people and how uh, we, we interact with people. So ultimately, it's not really a question of which approach is best or which approach is better. Um, it's just a matter of, you know, um, interpretation. Well, I mean, it's interesting. We go back to the sort of beginning of psychology and psychotherapy, mm -hmm. some of the big names like Freud and Jung, mm -hmm. et cetera. Um, very much their, their work was based upon sort of individual cases mm -hmm. from which they would then make massive generalizations. Mm -hmm. um, and there are obviously certain problems with that. Mm -hmm. uh, because um, the, Freud, for example, was dealing with, you know, uh, often very highly educated, upper middle class, almost aristocratic mm -hmm. uh, Viennese nationals. And, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you know, I would question how much of their experience, uh, lived experience, is similar to, say, for somebody like yourself who grew up mm -hmm. in um, uh, very humble backgrounds. And so mm -hmm. um, this is, I guess, where what you're talking about comes into its four, mm -hmm. um, which is looking at the actual numbers and whether they stack up, because it does seem slightly odd to try and build a whole theory of psychotherapy and, psych and human nature based mm -hmm. upon a handful of cases. Um, mm -hmm. So what would be sort of modern sort of numbers that we're dealing with in terms of um, getting a good evidence base for um, psychological interventions? What, what would it look like? In Freud's day, it was one case, mm -hmm. write a book about it and then go, everybody go, wow, that's amazing. So this is the way human beings are. What, what sort of study, what sort of methodologies are used now? What sort of numbers are involved in uh, creating a study? Just give us some idea about that. Yeah, but basically um, what, what people tend to do now is they, they're trying to run an, from, from a quantitative um, point of view, what people tend to do, what experimenters tend to do rather is um, they run an experiment, they compare it with um, a one group, they compare it with a treatment group, a treatment group is someone that receives an intervention and then they yeah. compare it with another group. So basically that's said, and then you try to run it um, with um, some statistical software commonly used with the SPSS. And then you try to, you know, um, quantitatively analyze it whether, um, how effective a certain intervention is. Yeah. Now contrast that with Freud, um, where of course Freud, I'm not, I'm not a big fan of um, Freud, um, but we, we have to credit Freud for, you know, um, pioneering um, the idea that behavior could be analyzed and yeah. we have to give him credit for that he, he 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 
that that's what that's what his major contribution is in psychology whether we're a big fan of his defense mechanism or the oedipus complex that he um proposed um that's another matter but i, I think um freud was also a product product of his time because he lived um during the victorian times so um 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 um, statistics was not really as sophisticated as it is now. So you just have to rely on observation. And basically that's what he, what he was doing. He's relying yeah. on observation and trying to an analyze the, the past experiences of the individuals. But whereas now um, we tend to be more sophisticated with our, our, our analysis and we try to be um, objective. So yeah. we have um, um, sophisticated softwares now that we use to you know, to quantify our observations. Yeah. And of course, um, um, the, the um, Freud's ideas are not, you know, they, they're not really outweighed over um, um, quantitative um, take on behavior. We still have um, psycho, psychoanalysis, we still have psychodynamic um, counseling, which is yeah. um, pretty much hinged on the idea of Freud. And yeah, um, it's, it's just a, a, a different take, really. Uh, for some people, um, it works for them, um, yeah, yeah. you know, talking to a psych psychodynamic counselor, whereas for some, they prefer a more, um, shall we say, um, a scientific approach. That's why they, they would rather take medication or they would rather look for a specific intervention to... Yeah, and we're not going to open up that whole yeah. debate. I mean, there's a yeah. still big debate going on and um, sort of people can have that argument. I mean, it's interesting. I mean, there are other modern versions of psychodynamic thinking like mm -hmm. interpersonal psychotherapy, which is, again, much more evidence-based. Mm -hmm. We use those types of... Um, but I guess um, the, the big shift, uh, if we think about... Uh, the big shifts in psychology and psychotherapy over the years. The big shift was the move from um, these more um, personal history-based forms of interventions to mm. uh, interventions that are much more based on the here and now. Mm. And that tends to be the two big distinctions, I guess, that goes mm. on. And then there are various forms of therapy, like cognitive analytic therapy, for example, which tries to marry both approaches and somehow make a blend um, mm. that, that works really well. So, but just thinking about the early days of psychotherapy and now the current days of um, psychological therapies um, and, um, and looking at that a bit. So you've mentioned it a little bit that, you know, um, sort of Freudian and post-Freudian thought was very much about the influence of one's personal history and upbringing and how that affected current behavior. Mm -hmm. that the treatment methodology was about if we could understand those influences, mm -hmm. somehow we could stop them or change them. Is that correct? Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, there's a there's a, um, uh, you, you mentioned earlier about inherited trauma, and I think that ties with it. You know, like your your early childhood experiences, especially the, the traumatic experiences that will carry over to your adult. You know how how you how you tend to react with the situations, and I, I think that's um that's a very fitting example. Yeah. And so um, the you know the the psycho psychodynamic. Um, approach the psychoanalytic approach. I think that would be the best way to, you know, to deal with that to help the um, the clients deal with their um, current experiences. Right, uh, and it's I mean it's, a, it's an interesting. And then so then we had the big with Aaron Beck mm. um, big shift in um, psychological therapy mm. into um, things like cognitive behavioral therapy, for example. Mm. Uh, and again, I'm not going to sort of get into the debate about which one's right and wrong. But mm. I don't think they're in opposition. I think. It's all an ongoing story mm. in many ways. And, and it's, it's really important that we sort of maintain that story. Mm -hmm. um, but the big shift, I guess, with uh, cognitive behavioral therapy was very much looking at current presentation of symptoms mm -hmm. and working with those, that current presentation of symptoms rather than necessarily going back in time. Mm -hmm. and, um, uh, and what was the evidence for that in terms of how that works and why that works, do you think? I, I think that the reason for that, and I, I, I'm not um, a chartered psychologist and um, I'm, I'm not a trained counselor, but I think that the reason why it works is that you're trying to help people put into perspective what they're capable of doing right. and um, in, in relation to what they've experienced. And you, you're trying to highlight that you have this ability because um, some people were able to do it, so you can also do it. And um, that's also in, of course, in conjunction with other therapies. So I, I think that's, um, you know, um, the, the big shift that you're, 
you just mentioned to earlier. Um, yeah. It's not just, you know, just talking about your earlier experiences, but, you know, trying to contextualize it with your experience and the availability of resources. And of course, um, the, the support of mental health professionals. Yeah. And I, I, I think um, that's really a nice, you know, um, phase that um, the area of psychology has already, you know, achieved um, as, as, a, as a field, because it, it was able to, you know, um, is it was able to um, pick up, you know, pick out the good bits um, from 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 the earlier um, co contributions of psychologists and mental health professionals. Yeah, and I suppose there's something about when we start to do uh, larger studies that involve large numbers of people, mm -hmm. um, then we can begin to um, draw conclusions that may have more validity mm -hmm. across a whole range of people. So, and, you know, again, I think thinking about this idea of resilience um, and whether it's something that you have or you don't have or you can learn or you can't learn, mm -hmm. I guess from the early days of psychotherapy, uh, very much based upon your childhood experience, almost almost determined you in many mm -hmm. uh, whereas I suppose these days in modern sort of psychotherapies uh, we'd very much say that of course it doesn't determine you it has an influence mm -hmm. but the actions and the things uh, the things that you do right here and now uh, mm -hmm. will determine the way you're going to be in many ways mm -hmm. uh, and because yeah. I, I the, the, the earlier, um, of course, the, the earlier ideas in psychology is always rooted on the idea of whether it's na nature or nurture, as yeah. in the case of, say, for instance, other, um, other um, traits, shall we say, let's say, for instance, intelligence, um, we still don't agree whether it's, an, it's something which is, you know, you're already born with, or something that you could improve it, and, and I'm talking about the IQ. And, um, Probably that's the same thing with, you know, resilience. Is, is it something that we're really born with or is something that we develop um, or tr throughout the life course? And, um, but, but I, think, I think the important uh, thing that mental health professionals can do is just try to, you know, try to help individuals really thrive and flourish. Yeah. Um, yeah, whether, whether it's nature or nurture, it's, it's, really, it's really irrelevant because um, our, our end goal is just to, you know, help people lead a better, better life than they would, what, what they would have. Yeah. And let's come on to the thriving and flourishing. Before we do that, I just want to take a, a, a little break just to remind people this is a live show. Mm -hmm. uh, we've had some great interventions so far from people and uh, it'd be really lovely to hear from you if you have some questions uh, and uh, send them through to us. Um, I think that there are two watch parties going on. Mm -hmm. So if um, I've got a watch party going on, but I think um, also Teresa has started a watch party. So she may have questions on her watch party. Um, so just to let you know, Teresa, if you do, I can't see your watch party. So uh, you'll need to um, get those questions and comments over to me um, and, uh, and maybe join our watch party as well. But it's, it's great to have more than one party going on at the same time. I sort of, I'm all for diversity. Um, uh, so it'd be lovely to have your comments. The other way you can join in is that you can give us a call. Um, and it'd be great if you decided to join in by phone. The, the number to get us on is uh, 07506 319 745. That's 07506 319 745. Uh, and maybe um, somebody can put that into um, the comments section on Facebook um, so that people can see the number. If you're calling from abroad, it's plus 44, of course. So plus 44. 7506-319-745. So it'd be great to have your comments and your questions. Um, I've got Dennis with me. Hello, Dennis. It's great to have you. Dennis is a psychologist. Thanks for having me on. It's great to have you on. You're a doctor of, of all things. Did you? You're De Dr. Dennis. Is that what I call No, I'm not a doctor. I, I've did actually you? did a master's degree. Um, yeah, I'm still... Um, I'm still toying on the idea whether to do a PhD or not, um, but I might do. Yeah. Yeah. Because you, and interestingly, you've got you got involved in psychology. You've always been interested in psychology. I think you told me. Yeah. Um, um, straight when I went to uni, I did psychology straight away, and then I did a master's degree in psychology, and then I did another master's degree in psychology. So I have two master's degree in psychology. 
But right now, what I'm doing is managing a psychology platform. <laughs> yeah. And so tell us a little bit about that psychology platform and we'll come back to the, the discussion and what's involved in that psychology platform. Yeah, so my website is called Psychreg. It's um, basically just um, I'm publishing all sorts of articles within the themes of psychology, mental health and well-being. It has a podcast which is hosted by two Americans um, and they're, they're clinical psychologists. Um, Dr. Bernie Wilkinson and Dr. Richard Marshall, they're based in Florida. So that's one arm of Psychreg. Another arm is an academic journal. It's called Psychreg Journal of Psychology. Yeah. And I also organize um, conferences, mental health events. Um, more recently, I was in Malaysia in October. I've organized a, um, a three-day conference. So that's um, basically the nature of my job. And so your idea is to create this platform, is it for press professionals or for the public? Who, who is the intended audience? My intended audience is really the general public. So that's why a lot of um, the writing style on Psychreg is really, it's more, um, it's more modest form of writing. So we tend not to use um, jargon. And a lot of articles on Cyprus is also about mental health stories. I encourage people to um, publish their mental health stories, stories of recovery, stories of hope and resilience. And um, more recently, we've been publishing a number of um, um, stories relating to the experience of the lockdown. Sure. And um, my ultimate goal here is to provide a resource, resource which everyone can relate to. And my ambitious um, goal is to be one of the most visited websites, psychology website in the world. I know I'm quite a long way from it, um, but um, I'll um, do it one, one blog post at a time. <laughs> well, we need lots more spaces where people can get hold of, you know, good materials um, to, be able to think about. Um, so um, it, it's articles and videos or just articles? Um, for, for the websites, mainly articles. And then um, you will also find us on YouTube. Um, there's a podcast and I also do an, um, a series of interviews on my YouTube channel. And then um, for the more academic side, for, for the researchers, I have Sacred Journal of Psychology where I publish research-based articles. And what's your sort of YouTube channel called, just in case people want to find it? My YouTube channel is called uh, The DRH Show. So the best way to find me is just to punch in my name on YouTube, Dennis Reloho Howell. Yeah. Great. And then people will find your channel and they'll have these uh, free, amazing free resources, which is the sort of interviews that you're doing with people. Yeah, as so I've, I've, I interview people at least um, twice a week. So I, I interview all sorts of people within the field of psychology and mental health from academics to those people who have lived experience and just people who are basically interested about um, um, the theme of psychology and mental health. And yeah. it's also a way of, for me to, you know, to, to, to um, engage within the wider community um, so it's, it's nice. I, I was wondering about that. Is that quite an important issue for you? This idea of reaching out broader than just within the psychological community. Yeah, because um, um, I, I love I love hearing people's stories, and I love um, you know um, listening to people's idea, um, whether, whether it's psychology or not. And um, it's a way of you know it's, it's a way of educating myself. Um, and I also love to to interview people who I, who I idolize. Um, yeah. right. Who's your current idols so that we all know and we can go find them? Okay. I've recently interviewed um, the president of the Canadian Psychological Association. Uh, right. I interviewed him um, three days ago. And um, I, I like his, his name is Dr. Ian Nicholson. And the, the reason why I invited to interview him is that I really like his how he tries to you know um, diversify um, his his area. He's not just focused on academia, but he's also focused on you know having his own private practice, and that's on top of um, managing a psychological association. So I, I've invited him. Um, I've got lots of people that um, I also want to interview. Um, I'm, I'm a big fan of um, Dr. Jordan Peterson, yeah. um, Dr. Gad Saad, I also want to interview him. Um, 
And is there a particular area of psychology at the moment, apart from the research, of course, but is there a particular area that you're interested in personally at the moment? Yeah, um, for, for my research project, when I was doing my MSc, I did a research project on expressive writing. So that's something that I'm really interested about. Um, in, in, in layman's term, um, basically um, expressive writing is the idea that when you write something, when you express yourself in writing, it allows you to make sense of what's happening in your life. And as a result, um, you can be better manage your coping, your coping mechanism. And that ties- that the thing that some people call narrative therapy? Is that yeah, the narrative, it, it comes with different, um, um, it comes in different um, terms. Some people call it journaling, some people call it journal therapy, narrative therapy, expressive writing, or yeah. writing therapy. And in my case, as, as a blogger, some, for someone who runs um, a blog, um, I would, I'd like to extend my earlier research, um, you know, that the benefits of running a mental health blog. And um, some, some mental health charities already have um, advocated for it. Um, Mind, Mind actually runs a blog where they just invite people to share their mental health stories. And because um, according to Mind, it allows people to, you know, to make sense of what's happening to them. It allows them to, to cope effectively and positively with what's happening to them. And that's something that I'd love to explore in the future, um, how, how blogs can actually help people. And when we're talking about blogs, sometimes we're just limited to people who blog in English because a lot of blogs is, of course, based in English. So I'd like to find out how people in non-English speaking countries, um, what's their um, idea about blogging and um, coping. Yeah, I was saying, I mean, it's a, it's a comment that's coming up in the Facebook feed anyway, but I want to uh, bring it to you is the sort of... Um, uh, uh, the, the whole question about whether we should be placing personal and psychological material um, in these types of public spheres. Mm -hmm. So this is a, a live broadcast on Facebook Live. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, in the research conversation that you and I had uh, prior to this, we talked at quite some length about it raises personal issues and how you felt about that. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, one of the um, things that we discuss and that I talk to you about is the idea that uh, we all have to manage our own boundaries mm -hmm. uh, around these things and make sure that we feel safe. And I'd, I'd said to you in the conversation, you know, if something is, is there anything that you're not comfortable talking about? And you said, no, no, I'm pretty open. And I said to you, well, you know, if something does come up that you feel uncomfortable about, you should just say, I don't mm -hmm. want to talk about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, uh, that's that's always and then you know if that it's it hasn't happened yet in all the guests I've had on we've been running the show for over a year now as yet nobody has brought has said oh I don't want to talk about that it's uncomfortable it makes me feel too vulnerable um, but if somebody did my reaction would be that oh fantastic thanks for telling us that mm -hmm. because that's about holding safe personal boundaries mm -hmm. which are is really important. Mm -hmm. What's your take on us being in these types of environments as psychologists, as individuals, you know, talking about uh, these types of issues? Why do you think it might be a benefit and what are the risks, do you think? Uh, the, the benefit of it, because um, from, from what I've, I've, I've encountered, um, you know, publishing mental health stories from individuals, that they realise they're not on their own. They're not the only one who's suffering from depression. They're not the only one who have um, suicidal ideation and um, suicidal attempts. And um, when, when they realize that actually they've actually recovered with proper support and with proper intervention. So I, I, I think that we, it's important to highlight those stories. And um, the way I do it is I, I invite people. I never force people. And if they want to be anonymous, they can remain anonymous. Yeah. Um, and um, I, I think it's important to highlight those stories because a, a lot of the times when we talk about mental health, we always tend to focus on the negative aspect of mental health. But when we try to focus on, you know, the story of recovery and the story of, you know, um, getting the right support and getting the right intervention, that's also important to highlight as well. Um, I, I'd like to share to you the story of um, my friend who's based in New York, um, yeah. Maxwell Gutman. He's a prolific contributor to PsychReg. Um, he's been, um, I, I think I can share this because he's been quite open with this. Um, 
he has um, a lived experience of psychosis and schizophrenia, but with the right support, he was able to um, manage his symptoms. Yeah. And his story is very inspiring because after that um, ordeal of having schizophrenia, he's now teaching at Fordham University in New York. He's, a, he's, a, he's, a, he's an academic. And that, that's really an inspiring story. And um, he's, he's been very vocal about his experience. Oh. And he, he, he talks about it on, on one of my interviews um, on YouTube. Um, we, we, we talk about his experience and um, the, the reason why he keeps on talking about it is just to inspire people. And, you know, it's not just, it's, it's a serious um, it's a serious experience, you know, having schizophrenia, having you're hearing voices, you're having hallucinations, and you have to take an antipsychotic medication. But yeah. with the support of his parents, I met him in person. He's actually one of um, the speakers at the conference that I've organized in London two years ago, and he, he really delivered a powerful lecture. Yeah. And um, that, that, that's the kind of stories that I'm trying to promote on, on my website. Um, yeah. And I remember sort of when I still worked in the NHS, this is going back a while, mm -hmm. I'm quite old, um, but, um, and uh, they were asking uh, managers um, who had experience of mental health or mental illness, um, if they were willing to share their stories on the basis that um, if leaders in an organization were open uh, to those issues, it might encourage other people. Uh, in the workforce in the organization to come forward and say that they were struggling um, and the idea being that the sooner somebody gets help uh, with encouragement the sooner that we can deal with the problem mm -hmm. and usually the more effective the interventions are mm -hmm. so, so that's one of the things um, but I guess it's sort of thinking about the differences between, say, a program like this and maybe um, Jerry Springer Mm -hmm. and what might be the differences um, going on and thinking about them. I, I guess one of the things for me is that, um, you know, we had that conversation before the show went up, which was to check what was safe for you uh, to talk about. And so we talked about safety and boundaries. And, mm. and one of the other things I, I think that is important about this type of show is, I mean, I, I generally tend to uh, invite on professionals in the field. Mm -hmm. uh, and I use it professionals in the field in a broad sense because I also invite on um, skilled amateurs, as it were, people who are uh, leading charities, etc., who have lived experience and they, they have processed that lived experience. But I guess the, the question, the question that's come up in the Facebook feed, which I think is a very good question, is: Is this therapy that we're doing right now, or is it something else? What would be your thinking? I think what we're doing right now is making um, discussions about mental health relevant and accessible. And I, I think that's really important um, when we're not trying to replace um, the information that you can access on um, mental health charities or big psychological organizations, but we're trying to make it more digestible. We're making, we're trying to make it more accessible because um, we don't have to, you know, we, we, we don't have to pretend that, um, a lot of the resources that we can access, let's say, for instance, in British Psychological Society, um, that the way information are presented is not really um, written in modest language. It's more um, accessible for people with um, um, who are in in academia, who are researchers. But I think we're, we're just trying to offer the same information, but we're presenting it in a more um, you know, accessible, modest, digestible yes. way. And I, I think it's, it's important. And um, just like what we've said earlier, um, there's, there are different approaches um, to mental health and that goes the same with, you know, conversations about mental health. Um, yes. so some people may prefer a more um, professional, more formal um, discussions and conversations about mental health, but some people um, want it to be more personalized, just like yes. what we're doing right now. It's, more conversational where it's like talking to a friend absolutely and i do think of you as more of a friend dennis having worked with you on men's radio station um and having had your amazing skills in terms of promoting the show uh, but there's two questions that have now come up and i want to give to you but one of the questions is um i guess around this idea that you know we are sharing personal material for example mm -hmm. and the, the questioner is 
sort of surprised and saying, why are you sharing personal material? Um, surely that's what you do with your therapist. You don't do that on a show like this. So is this therapy that we're doing right now, do you think, or is it something else? I wouldn't um, call it a therapy because um, um, for, for me, therapy is something that should be done in private, in confidence, because if you're, um, if, if this would be therapy, there's some things that, you know, um, that should be just be kept between you and the, the therapist. I think what we're doing right now is um, more of a, um, more of a friendly chat, shall we say, um, a friendly chat, which just happens to be devoted about um, experience and mental health, but you don't have to take everything at, shall we say, at face value. You don't have to take everything as a professional advice. Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess it's interesting, isn't it? Thinking about the different types of boundaries that people have. Yeah. So given, I guess it's a bit of a sort of um, occupational hazard of me. Mm -hmm. um, I've spent many years in the psychotherapy profession um, and I tend to be very open about mm -hmm. things as a consequence. Um, and some people I think find that um, quite odd. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I have very intimate conversations with people very quickly. Mm -hmm. I start talking about feelings, et cetera, et cetera. And so people can feel like that that's therapy when I don't think it is. I think it's a therapist talking, mm -hmm. um, which may at times feel like therapy. <laughs> and and, it isn't. and it's, it's something that my friends have said to me. I mean, I think it's a really interesting question that the, the person's brought up. It's mm -hmm. something my, I've, I, I remember a friend of mine once said, uh, uh, we were sitting in the kitchen having dinner and um and she said i'm not one of your bloody patients no yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I think it's important to um highlight that you know um, a therapist talking is not a, a, a talking therapy it's not a form of talking therapy it's just no. you know another profession professional who happens to be talking it's just somebody who can't hold professional boundaries very well, maybe. Yeah. Another question that's come up, um, which I think is a really good question, um, is that um, um, do you have suggestions? Does Dennis have suggestions on how people get involved in starting healthy conversations around mental health? I think the first um, step towards any conversation, whether it's mental health or not, is just be honest about it. You know, be, be honest about your experience. And... Um, uh, that, that, that's my same approach about, you know, ma managing my, managing my platform. Um, I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm different from most of the mental health bloggers because I don't have a live experience. And I'm, I'm not saying that, you know, um, that's, that's ha having a live experience is the best approach, but yeah. I, I'm, I'm just being honest. Some, 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 sometimes I tell them that I don't really understand how it is to have depression. I don't understand how it is to have anxiety because I don't have any of those experience. Um, yeah, this, the first thing, be honest. And um, secondly is I think to be, you know, to be open to the idea of what's, you know, what would be the feedback of, of people. Um, it's like, you know, talking to, to a psychotherapist, when you open up to a psychotherapist about your experience, about your mental health issues, um, what, what's going to happen? You have to be open about it. Yeah, yep. honesty and being prepared. So not seeing the feedback as some sort of attack, that you've done something wrong. No, because I, I don't think that um, psychotherapists, by and large, um, on, on the merit of their role, they're meant to attack you. Um, they, they might give you some, some feedback, but you don't have to take it as a criticism. But I, I think that the role of um, mental health professionals is just to, you know, um, try to identify where you are yeah. and help you to get to where you should be. And I guess so this is my experience, maybe some of my experience as well is, is useful to think about in answering the question. I think, you know, one of the things that having spent many, many years sort of having private conversations with people mm -hmm. as a therapist, as a clinician, sort of, um, and then holding those boundaries and make sure I don't let the, that spill. I've also spent many years like you in these types of spaces, mm -hmm. talking about therapeutic things, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and it's a very different experience to the private experience of therapy mm -hmm. itself. So talking about these types of things. And one of the experiences I have, and I don't know if you have it as well, is that it can trigger reactions in people. Mm -hmm. And that, that can happen. 
simply by their watching and listening to a conversation about um, difficult issues such as trauma, such as depression, such as anxiety, um, such as difficult life experiences, um, that could be triggering to uh, other experiences that people have had. Is that something you've come across as well? I've never come across with that, but I'm mindful that, um, that there's a possibility that um, a lot of my resources that I publish could be yep. triggering to some people. That's why I always signpost them to um, charities, mental health charities, and every right. every article in Cyprus always had a disclaimer that um, not because you find something on the internet, um, take it as a, um, you know something that could replace um, professional mental health advice. And I always say to people that the thing that you see on Cyprus is. Are mainly for information purposes only. And that, that's similar to most of the things that you see on the internet. Um, it's mainly there for information purposes only. And if you really think that you are in serious need of mental health professional um, advice, then you should um, go to a mental health professional. That's why what I do on Cycrish is um, I run a directory of mental health professional. Um, okay. it, that to be included on, on that directory is free. So um, I, I, I always have a disclaimer that if you need a mental health professional after reading this article, um, here's, a, here's a directory of mental health professionals that you could, you know, that you could speak to. And that's the same thing that I do on my YouTube channel when, um, you know, on the video description box, I always say that this interview should not replace um, advice from a mental health professional. If you need help, go to this website. Great tips there, Dennis. Really, really great tips. So be be open, uh, be honest about your own experience, your own limitations as well, whatever your experience is. Be be authentic about your own experience, I guess, as well as being honest, being authentically you, not justifying or rationalising or explaining yourself away, but just, this is me. Um, and then make sure that you, you know, have backup should people be upset or disturbed by mm -hmm. um, the material. So be able to signpost them in the, the appropriate direction. Um, we, we've got um, a comment from Goldie Blake, which is a, um, uh, an interesting comment. I wonder what you think about this. She says, um, therapy requires humility. She doesn't really say who has to have the humility. I'm assuming she means the therapist because I'm a therapist, but maybe she means patient as well. Maybe she means, I'm not sure which one she means, but let's talk about that idea for both uh, before we yeah. go into a little break again. Yeah, I, I, I love the idea that, you know, that it requires, um, therapy requires humility. It requires humility from the standpoint of the client because, you know, like, in a way, you, you, you're allowing yourself to be scrutinized by another person, and that takes a lot of humility, you know, that um, you're, you're, you're offering yourself um, to a stranger on, on what they should do, and that's very, um, it requires a lot, a lot of humility. And also, you know, to be, to be a counselor, that requires humility, because you should not treat your client as an inferior, because they're asking for your help, but I think you have to realize yeah. that, you know, when, when you're when you're in the position of a mental health professional, that you're, you're not above them, but you're just actually um, you, you just happen to have um, the experience, the, the knowledge, but you're not in any way um, superior to the other person. Yeah. So that, that's a yeah. good point from um, Goldie Blake. Yeah, that's lovely. So the idea is that. Um, we're having an adult adult conversation yeah an adult to adult conversation right yeah. and then one adult has maybe some particular skills and experiences that mm -hmm. are useful hopefully useful because the other one is paying for them so uh, mm -hmm. that, that they are useful and professionally okay so great thanks for that um so just want to remind people this is a live show um, um we're going out through facebook live um it'd be great for you to join us um, in the next few weeks we will be um, moving on to more platforms so it won't just be on Facebook live it will be on uh, LinkedIn um, and other um, uh, platforms as well simultaneously um, so that we can get into a broader audience but we're in the process like a lot of people of just catching up with all the technical stuff that we need mm -hmm. to do and uh, James who's the technician working on this who's quietly sort of humming in the background somewhere um, is looking at all of those so hopefully we'll begin to meet a, a broader audience and and obviously these broadcasts are then available 
um, via the website, um, uh, normcdermot.net. You can go on there and access them. And they'll be available to sort of stream and we'll place them all on the uh, YouTube channel we've got, which is again, just my name, uh, Norm McDermott. Um, and um, you can sort of see them and um, see if they're useful and if they're helpful, I think they are. Um, and we've got over a year's worth of stuff now. So we've got some quite, um, quite, a, quite a catalog now of things that, um, that we can offer to people. Now, like you, Dennis, I'm very keen um, to have these spaces uh, and have them yeah. grow. So it'd be lovely to hear from you this evening about um, sort of your thoughts, experiences and comments on the, what we've been discussing this evening. Uh, and also you can call us if you wish, it's great because this bit is live. Obviously, if you're streaming this after the event, don't call us because that's my number and it <laughs> might be an inconvenient time for me. But if it's on a Wednesday evening uh, on for this particular show, on Wednesday the 13th of May between uh, 9 and 10.30 uh, UK time, it's live and you are allowed to call me. It'd be lovely to hear from you and I can put you on the line uh, with Dennis. Um, so Dennis, you've had some really interesting comments and thoughts. You've, you've um, generated a lot of interesting ideas for people. We're coming into the sort of final sort of section of the show. Mm -hmm. um, when we begin to catch up really in, uh, in terms of what your current interests and your future plans are uh, and to hear from you uh, about the, the, um, the, the work as you understand it at the moment and, and what your dreams and hopes for of the future. So we've heard something about your work. Um, what we haven't heard is um, the research side of things. And I know you're, you're a very keen uh, researcher in um, sort of in, in psychology. What's your, what's your interest there in terms of, why, why do you find that quite important to you? My research area, and I've written a number of research articles is mainly on expressive writing, which I mentioned earlier, yeah. um, and also um, promoting resilience and also the, the um, psychological effect of blogging. And in the future, I would like to do a research about um, trying to address suicidal ideation in terms of having mental health bugs as a form of intervention. And that's what I'd like to look into. Um, I'm also interested in, um, in other non-psychology um, stuff. I'm interested about social media. I'm yeah. interested about um, web design, yeah. And I have an obsession about fonts. About phones, did you say? Fonts, you know, like- Fonts, oh, okay. Aerial, um, aerial Roboto, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, that's interesting. Maybe we'll go to that, maybe we'll not, we'll see. Our sort of obsessions are maybe the thing, uh, but we'll see. Um, so um, I, if I would sum that up, I would say that you have a really sort of keen interest in these online spaces and online worlds, social mm. media, mm. websites, blogs. Mm. What's driving that interest? In? Why are you sort of interested in, in those types of areas? It's because of me being introvert. I really thrive <laughs> on working on my own. Um, yeah. be before I took blogging seriously, I was a, I had normal jobs. I was a university lecturer. And then after that, when I first came to this country, uh, my job was working for a peer agency. I was working for marketing. Well, I could sort of, um, for lack of better term, I could sort of fake it, you know, working for a peer agency, you have to be really bubbly and personable. I could fake that. <laughs> um, I'm more comfortable working on my own. Um, uh, I'd rather work um, on a quiet place. And so that's um, why... Okay. This whole lockdown thing must be absolutely heaven for you. Uh, it's not really heaven because um, although I, I'm an introvert, I prefer to, you know, eat somewhere nice. <laughs> that's something that you could not Are you do saying your right kitchen's now. not somewhere nice? Okay. No, um, right now I survive on um, pasta and pizza and takeaways. <laughs> and um, thank God um, we have the patience to queue for two hours in Tesco. Yeah. So tell me, as a psychologist, I mean, there's a lot of stuff in the media about online spaces being bad for you. Um, clearly, you don't think that. Clearly, you think that they're they are positive, they have a, a positive impact. What are the sort of positive impacts? You've alluded to it. Um, yeah, um, I, I wouldn't say that um, 
um, social media is all good, but I'm, I'm, I, I would say that the good bits of of social media outweighs its um, its lapses, its disadvantages. Okay. Um, first is because um, social media allows us to have conversations about mental health that you know we we wouldn't have this in in the 80s we wouldn't have this in the 90s i was born in i was born in 1982 and um growing up we we don't really talk about you know we don't really talk about depression we don't talk about domestic abuse we don't talk about toxic masculinity but yeah. it's something that um is, is now um in the open that we get to talk about is because of social media and that's Mainly because you know, um, in social media, you 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 can be anonymous, and so people are more confident talking about their narratives. And also, um, it's also I think there's something about social media where it's it's very democratic. Yeah, it's very dem democratic. Not hierarchical at all, is it? Yeah. Yeah, but um, tw Twitter is also because um, I, I mainly use Twitter. Um, Twitter is also could could also be quite. Um, divisive, um, right. especially when it comes to politics, um, and that that's one thing that is really um, sad about social media. It could be, it could be quite um, depressing sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, we lost you there. We missed that bit. So. Oh, sorry. Um, what Dennis I'm saying is that what well, social, yeah, well, social media so, uh, is. I'm you just going to continue, and hopefully he will unfreeze. James is listening. Am I back now? <laughs> I actually think it's uh, Noel who has frozen. Because I oh, can hear okay. you, right? And you can hear me. Yeah, I can hear you. <laughs> so I actually think it's Noel whose uh, internet has gone down. Yeah. So, um, Tell him gonna... to pay the bills. So, yeah, I'll make sure he pays his internet <laughs> bill, that's for sure. Yeah. Um, for those of you wondering or listening, by the way, I'm James the Technician. I'm here when things go wrong. And obviously oh, I was so going to pay the bills. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I didn't. I did not mean that in a bad way. We all like a bit of humour. I'm just going to reach out to Noel now and see what's happened. Because yeah. uh, something's not <laughs> gone right with him. Uh, hey, not so. It's, it's something's happened on your end because I'm still with Dennis on the show talking. I think your internet must have dropped or something. Um, what 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 should we do? Shall we carry on talking until you get back? Will do. I'll handle that now then. Cool. I'll call you, I'll call you when I'm done. Blah, blah, blah. Cool. So, as as the technician foresaw, or something has gone wrong with Noel's internet, this is why you pay me, people, because um, I have this power. But so, unfortunately, we don't know when Noel's going to return. So, we are going to have to unfortunately say goodbye for this week. Um, but thank you so much for coming, Dennis. I really Thanks enjoyed for inviting me. Oh, it's been a pleasure. You know, I, we, we all love yeah. you. Mm -hmm. Dennis, you've been very, very. I, lo I love too. getting invites from familiar people. Oh yeah, and I mean, there's <laughs> actually a little bit of a uh, backstory that I guess some people don't know, which is um, we used to all three of us used to work together, didn't we? Yeah, um, at men's radio station. At men's radio station. Oh, I think Noel ah. has rejoined us. Mm -hmm. I'm here. Were you just taking us off air, James? Uh, sure. Uh, I will. Do I was just wrapping up the show because we're still on air. Okay. Oh, well, what's, if we're still on there, let's just, um, why don't I wrap up the show? Go for it now. So I'm going to start my video. There we go. And just remain, remain. don't know what happened there, folks, but the joys of uh, modern technology. We were just talking, singing the praises of uh, online spaces and, yeah. and, and then mine crashes, such as life. <laughs> uh, good to be back. I mean, we don't have that much time left, which is uh, we're coming towards the end of the show. Um, uh, it's been a fantastic show so far, um, but we were just talking about um, the um, how useful um, um, social media can be. I mean, you just started talking, Dennis, about um, how it can be divisive. But I was just about to sort of comment and maybe ask you a question about um, 
um, the, um, hang on, let me get my comments on, there we are, um, uh, sort of comment on this, because one thing I've done in the past, and I was thinking about this idea of that as um, a more of an introverted person, you're quite uh, attracted to sort of online spaces um, because mm -hmm. of your personality type, which I get. Um, there's also a clinical application, and I've done this with um, people who are more anxious and socially anxious. Mm -hmm. uh, things like Facebook and other forms of social media platforms can be actually quite therapeutic. Mm -hmm. And so I, I have on occasion um, encouraged um, clients to set up Facebook pages, for example, who, who find it incredibly difficult, even agoraphobic, um, to get out the house and find it um, impossible to sort of develop social networks because of their social anxiety. So I think there are definite clinical benefits uh, around this. But I sort of, I also echo that idea that you've begun to touch upon, that mm -hmm. these are spaces in which conversations can happen that never happened before. Um, and you mentioned things like toxic masculinity, for example, as a space uh, in which we can begin to explore some of those issues uh, and, and get um, those um, sort of stories out there. And you've talked a lot about stories, and I wonder if you, as we're getting towards the end of the show, can tell us why you think stories are important, because that's been a theme all the way through uh, mm -hmm. this evening. Um, st stories are important because they, they allow us to, you know, to, to visualize what could have been, what should have been. And um, that's also true in terms of mental health, like what would have been if I do this and what could have been if I didn't do that. And I, I think that's what um, stories are trying to, to teach us. And also, um, I think by nature, um, people are always drawn to stories, you know, because we're social creatures and, you know, social, social, socialization and interaction are always, you know, tied in with stories because you, you, you will always hear it from other people, how they interacted and how was the experience. So, yeah, uh, as people, we, we would always be drawn with stories. And yeah. Yeah, we, we see different forms of stories in, in social media, in blogs, in, in, in resources. Yeah, it does seem to be sort of a very important part of human experience. I mean, it, it predates even sort of um, the written word and books and mm -hmm. literacy, for example, that, uh, you know, um, early humans had very much an oral culture in which they passed stories on. Stories are very treasured mm -hmm. actually, in many ways. And I remember my, my training, I, I, um, one of our trainers was a specialist in stories and um, she would always say to us that when we're using stories in, in therapy, we shouldn't change the words, that we should repeat the story exactly and, and treasure them and treasure all these stories. So um, it does seem to be a very important part of uh, what the human experience. There's something about stories, I think, also, again, and coming to this theme I have about social media is that um, stories are also quite democratic, um, that we all do have a story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, because um, yeah, re regardless of your class status, regardless of your um, um, ethnicity, regardless of your experience, you always have a story, and um, we we we're all winners when we're, we're telling our story. Because you know, um, when we tell a story, we're we're always the the lead character, we're always the protagonist. So that you know, that that's that's um, yeah. that's uh, that's a chance to highlight. Um, yeah. our successes and there's also a chance to learn from our failures as humans. Yeah okay so we are coming towards the end we've got about 10 minutes left and I sort of want to use this time to sort of uh, maybe draw some of the themes together but also think about the future um, and thinking about some positive things uh, and thinking about uh, as we come out of lockdown um, what sort of things that we can share with people to think about in terms of in terms of going forwards and um, we're looking at collectively as a, as a society, quite an uncertain future at the moment. And I wonder, you know, what your experience, Dennis, is of uncertainty and, and how you manage um, uncertainty within yourself and whether you might be able to share that with people to give them some ideas around that. Mm -hmm. I think the most effective way in trying to deal with uncertainty is to seek support, whether it's emotional support or um, financial support um, yeah. always realize that there are people who was, was willing to help you yeah. 
Yeah. And uh, we, we just don't realize that, you know, that there's always people around us who's always willing to um, provide comfort and who, who's always willing to talk to us. And I, th I think we have to acknowledge that. And also just try to um, be positive. I know it sounds a bit cliche, but um, we really have to tap into that ability to, you know, to look into the positive aspects of, of our experience. And, and um, that's one thing that I would like to highlight in this conversation, the importance of positivity and highlighting what we can do. Yeah, and positivity, I think, in particularly when we're in adverse situations, mm -hmm. uh, allows for the potential of growth. It's mm. slightly different, isn't it, to resilience? Resilience is about minimizing harm, mm. um, but positivity and growth mindsets mm. uh, accept that some things might harm us, but mm. we can change and positively grow from that harm. Mm -hmm. And that's actually what we call in psychology post traumatic growth. You know, that exactly. um, a, a previous adverse experience could actually shape us into, you know, promoting certain skills and promoting um, positive emotions. So that, that's a really important point uh, um, as we come. Um, in terms of um, your future, what are your plans now for your future? What, what do you hope to be working on going forwards? Um, um, right now, um, I'm supposed to be preparing for a conference that I'm organizing with um, a PR agency in London. Um, it's called Good Mental 2020. Um, of course, um, because of, of, of um, the lockdown, um, we're still in limbo whether as to um, proceed with that event. But it's definitely going to happen in the future, um, maybe not this year, but um, next year. And um, I'm still I'm focusing all my time and energy to you know, improving my website. And more recently, I just wrote a book. Um, it's called Let's Talk About Behavior. Right. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm taking this opportunity to invite your audience, your listeners to um, um, take a look at my book. It might be of interest to you. Um, it's called Let's Talk About Behavior. Just um, type in my name on Amazon. And tell us about the book. What's what it looking at? Um, the book is actually a collection of essays that I wrote on a range of topics within, of course, the themes of psychology and mental health. Um, it's more about, you know, resilience, expressive writing, um, the things that I write about in, in Psychology and in other publications. It's a collection of articles. Um, Fantastic. So that's available through Amazon, did you say? Yeah, it's available through Amazon. And right now I'm also um, co-authoring a book with um, some academics in Malaysia. We're writing an ebook about resilience and um, coronavirus. Um, it's, it's an ebook. I'm co-authoring it with four other authors. Um, hopefully it will be available in the next two months. Uh, well, I'm, certainly, by... I'm certainly going to recommend it to people. I put the, yeah. the title in the comment section so that yeah. you can, um, people can look at it and they can find it on um, Amazon. Uh, yeah. I would certainly encourage people. I've known Dennis for a while. He's a great guy. And Thank also you. when you when you get to know his personal story, the sort of um, the challenges that uh, he's come yeah. through and the uh, life journey that he's had himself. I mean, I think that we could all agree that uh, we've we've all got a lot to learn from him about dealing with challenge and dealing with adversity and dealing with it with um, intelligence and humour uh, as well, and um, with a certain amount of grace. Um, and if you know, I think it's maybe an aspiration of all of us to be able to deal with adversity um, uh, with grace. So uh, it's been a fantastic show this evening, Dennis. I've been really, really happy to have you on. The, the comments that we're getting are, are wonderful. It's been very interesting that people have felt um, very encouraged to uh, make comments and, um, and join in. So th that's been great. But um, the comments right at the end are um, um, from Goldie. I'd like to you know, thank you for your interventions. But she said, um, this is this has been a great place um, that it's um, it's given me permission to relax. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. And I think that's what you're hoping for, you know, to make people oh. feel good, you know. And at yeah. the end of the day, um, they they forget um, the, the the seriousness of the situation. Yeah. So we are just about at the end of the show. I want to thank you, Dennis, for coming on. Um, thanks, James, um, for uh, your work. Sorry about the. Um, interruption when the Wi-Fi dropped out. Not a lot we can do about that. Mm. Unfortunately. Just one of those things. Um, better than me just falling asleep. 
which I hate to admit I have done on occasion, but I didn't. It wasn't me falling asleep that time. It was actually uh, a technical hitch. Um, thanks for everybody who's joined in. Uh, great comments, great um, sort of um, um, uh, questions and thoughts uh, that you shared with us. And, and I hope this sort of grows as that people get more comfortable with um, being able to take the risk of sharing their thoughts and feelings um, during these shows. Um, so James, I think we're just at the end now. So I'd like to say goodbye to everybody and I'll see you all again uh, next week uh, on Wednesday um, at 9pm um, uh, UK time um, so thank you all very much and bye bye for now thank you